Welcome to Azure Lane Meta. Today we are going to be doing probably the most anticipated video on my channel, the Advanced PVP Guide. <laughs> Welcome back guys. Today we are going to be doing the advanced PVP guide. I did a video for the basics of PVP. If you haven't watched that video, I recommend that you guys go take a look at it. I'm going to be assuming that everyone who's watching this video has finished that video already. So I'm going to break this video down into two parts. The first part is the special mechanics of PVP because it's quite different than PVE content and really the advanced sections of those sort of mechanics that aren't just obvious. The second part of this video is going to be doing how to rank really high and using methods like the sandbagging or the lagging method to try and get more points and rank higher, rushing, etc. So the real basics is in PVP we don't have any submarines, we don't have any meow officers, and we don't have any fleet tech. So you don't have to worry about any of that with regards to PvP, just six ships. However, the modifiers to the stats are actually quite different. So the first modifier that we want to look at is health. Health is modified by a multiple. The multiple is 0.9 times 0.012 times level. That means that at level 120, your multiplier to every ship's health is 2.34, meaning your ships are just going to be more healthy. They're going to have a larger health pool to work from. And that levels are play a significant factor in how much health there will be. That's kind of why Juno is really good, because it's 25% health, but on a ship that's 2.34 times larger health pool. Okay, then we go into each class has specific differences in their modifiers. So destroyers have 25% less damage taken. So they have a damage reduction. And that's that's a lot. That's one of the reasons why Yukikaze seems very tanky. It's one of the reasons why destroyers have a lot of relevance in survivability fleets. They also have an increase of 5% in the evasion rate. Not evasion stat, evasion rate. So that's the better one. And so destroyers basically with over two times health, 25% less damage taken and 5% more chance to dodge straight pure. They are a lot more beefy than would otherwise be in PvE. That's why they're more relevant in PvP. Light cruisers probably get the best in terms of the modifiers. They get 15% more damage that they deal. So they deal 15% more damage and they take 20% less damage. So a 20% damage reduction. So this is a combination of they deal more damage, they take less damage than normally. That's one of the reasons why light cruisers pretty much dominate a lot of the meta. Now, heavy cruisers have frequently been the weakest of the Vanguard ships. Now, as we get some of the newer meta ships, they have some just insane stats and insane skills that make them relevant, but generally, heavy cruisers only get a 15% damage reduction that they, or at least in the damage that they take. So, still benefit over what they would do in PvE, but they get the least amount of benefits of any of the Vanguard ships. So, keep that in mind. All of the Vanguard ship gets boosted because otherwise the main fleet would just delete them very quickly. Continuing on to that, all backline ships get a 20% damage penalty. Light carriers get a reduction in that. They only get a 10% damage penalty. So that's something why Centaur, who has carrier-like stats, is actually really good in PvP because she only gets a 10% damage penalty versus a 20% damage penalty. I guess it's kind of relevant to say that repair ships get no penalty but they don't really deal any damage skills are a percentage so any percentage damage dealt is going to the of the skills are going to just kind of tack on to these and then after all of this one of the other things that you might want to note is that the attacking fleet gets a boost this is commonly regarded as a 20 percent boost Actually, what it is, is it's a 0.8 damage modifier on the defense fleet, meaning that you get 0.2 times more damage, which actually, if you think about it, is a 25% increase over what the defense fleet can deal. But the point is, 
there's a 20% damage reduction on top of the already 20% damage reduction penalty for the back line of the defense fleet. So that is a significant portion of decrease in the damage that you're going to be taking as an offensive fleet. This is one of the reasons why you should be winning a very high percentage of your exercises. Other things to note is that plane health is quadrupled. So basically this makes them almost impossible to shoot down. This means that AA stats are pretty useless in PvP. It also means that having slower planes to kind of shoot down planes with AA is kind of not important. So aviation gasoline, the downsides to it are non-existent. Speaking of why aviation gasoline is very significant is crash damage applies in PvP. I don't know of any other game mode in Azure Lane where crash damage applies, at least for the player. Obviously, the opponents that you're facing will have crash damage against you. So each plane that you have has a crash damage variable. One of the highest ones is the Barracuda. This is why for PvP, the Barracuda is one of the best torpedo bombers. And that crash damage is going to be 0.3 times whatever that base is of the plane that you're using plus 0.7 times a percentage of the remaining health of that plane times the remainder of that base crash damage. This means that a full health plane will basically get the crash damage total and that like a half health plane would get like 65% of that crash damage total. So that means that crash damage can be affected a little bit by dealing damage to that plane. So AA is not completely useless. Of course, AA also reduces the aviation damage that you do take, but on top of that, it kind of will reduce that crash damage. Having the aviation gasoline does help with this, increasing the damage because you will get a higher health pool. So generally it's actually considered that you will actually deal more damage in PVP with an aviation gasoline due to the fact that you will get extra crash damage. Also, the faster flying has no negative in PvP, as mentioned before, and getting to your opponents faster is actually more beneficial in PvP for mirror matches. Fire damage and flood damage are not changed at all, so there's nothing really to note there. If both vanguards are eliminated, all the remaining ships get 300 times their reload and a 300 base added to that reload. This effectively makes almost all planes about cut their airstrike or their salvo in half. It can change a little bit varying on each ship, but it's usually about half. I only have two more points to add on the PvP battle mechanics. The first is that the center of the battlefield or where your vanguard starts or the pair of your vanguard and your opponent's vanguard is not in the middle of the battle it's actually closer to your main fleet what does this mean that means that your main fleet's auxiliary guns will be able to reach your opponent's vanguard it also means that your vanguard's torpedoes will have a hard time reaching your opponent's main fleet while your opponent's vanguard torpedoes will be able to reach your main fleet easily. This means torpedoes are more effective in the defense fleets. This also means that auxiliary guns are super important for offensive or attacking fleets, but not for defensive fleets as much at least. So that's kind of, I guess, the only really relevant part in terms of they'll be closer to you. This means that on an attack fleet, FDG will proc her barrage right at the start, but not necessarily on a defense fleet. Although she'll probably proc on the defense fleet as well, because her barrage range is insane. Also, preloaded torpedoes will fire in the order of the front ship, the middle ship, the rear ship. There is a universal delay. It's about a half second, so keep that in mind, but that's, I guess, you know, pretty standard for all content, not really PvP specific. And that's really all the differences between PvP and regular PvE content. There's not really any other differences that I haven't mentioned either in this video or the previous video. Have you ever wondered how I get my game footage for Azure Lane? Well, I use my computer and Bluestacks. Bluestacks is a Android emulator for PC, and it allows you to play mobile games like Azure Lane on your computer. If you're interested in an Android emulator, there are referral download links 
in the description under affiliates. So now that you know how the battle mechanics of PvP work, now you need to learn how to rank. Now in my previous beginner video, I gave the very basics of how rank score works and how you can get most of the way there. However, that little extra inch that gets you into the Admiral of the Navy, we're going to talk about now. To get into the Admiral of the Navy, you're likely going to have to win close to 100% of your battles in a, in a season. You could maybe drop one or two battles, but if you're going to be dropping any of your battles, just go with the similar strategy showed in my other video. That will get you the highest rank. Winning is the number one way to get points. You want to get as many wins as possible. Only start to use these strategies that I'm going to go over in this video once you can consistently win 209, 210 exercises in a season. If you're not there yet, that's okay. Keep grinding your fleets and just beat the opponents that you can. So the first thing you're going to want to do is obviously battle the most left person. This is the very basic section for what you need to do. And right here is a chart based on what is called the sandbagging or lagging method. So the one on the left is if you were to win every battle in a season and you did not do any of the sandbagging method but you did play against the leftmost player this would be how many points you get per exercise for the whole season so this is like not necessarily bare minimum but if you're going undefeated this is your bare minimum so now let's talk about the sandbagging method this middle chart is what i call the realistic score for somebody who is sandbagging and as you can see it can make a significant difference almost 50 points over the course of the season that is literally like five extra wins that could be if you actually missed a reset of five the difference between sandbagging and non-sandbagging could make the difference in literally losing five exercises so that's kind of how important this is and even then this is not the most that you can do so how does the sandbagging method work or at least the basic sandbagging method how it works is when a season starts on that monday in whatever time zone you're in you'll get five exercises if you wait 12 hours you'll get another five exercises and be at the 10 exercise cap in about five hours and 45 minutes right before you go over the cap you can do five exercises to go back down to five and then you will get five more exercises that will get you at 10 and you'll continuously 15 minutes before every reset that would go from 10 to 15 do five more so that you go from 5 to 10 instead of 10 to 15 and then lose out on those five exercises which is equivalent to five losses not playing your exercise is five losses or not playing your five exercises or going over cap is five losses so the reason this works is because you get points based on how many rank score your opponent that you play has and they can only have their rank score go up they can't have it go down they can decrease in the rankings they can do all these sort of things but their rank score can never go down unless there's some sort of server reset or something so that means there is no harm in ever waiting waiting all it ever does is give all your opponents an opportunity to play their exercises and get more points really win their exercises and get more points so by waiting you're giving an opportunity to gain points and no opportunity to lose points that's why you wait as long as possible so what this will do is it will give you that bonus point every five exercises and that's why you get 50 extra points at the end of the season so there is a method that allows you to get that extra point or extra points earlier in the season every battle and it's based on luck. And this is why a lot of people consider ranking number one really luck based because it's a lot of luck to go from this middle section. Almost anybody can sandbag and do this middle section to going to this rightmost section where you're getting it every single time. Now, every sort of ranking system always has a little bit of luck, whether it's the RNG in the battle or it's the RNG of who you're paired with. This is the same as any other ranking game. So how this works is basically you have to be continuously playing throughout the day and watching when your opponents do their exercises. So let's say there are six hours between now when you get the first reset and when you would go over cap in six hours. So in that six hours, you need to make sure that each of your opponents 
plays their exercises. So if your first opponent plays their exercise, then immediately afterward you play your exercise and then you'll get repaired with four more people. You'll wait for that person to play their exercises. You'll beat them and then proceed to do that five times. And the reason that's hard is if any of the people that you are playing against decide that they're going to lag, that stops the chain because what happens is they wait five hours and 45 minutes. You play your ex or you play your exercise against them to beat them. But then there's only 15 minutes left for your other four people to go. And at that point you'll be repaired against people who are around your rank. And thus they won't typically in that last 15 minutes make their run, right? They're either going to miss it or they've already made their run and they're they've lost or, or something like that. So you're, very hard to actually get all five. This is unrealistic, but the reason it's here is because this is kind of the maximum cap. You shouldn't be able to get much higher than this. A point here or there, because sometimes people can get double extra points and that's not really accumulated here. So there is, this is not the hard maximum, but it's pretty close to the maximum that anyone would get in the season. If someone has more points than this, it's either probably because a server reset allowed them to get more exercise attempts or they're hacking, one of the two. So due to the absolute insanity that in involves this rightmost method where you have to log in every 15 minutes and see if your opponents have done their exercises and hope that you don't get stuck behind somebody who can't win their exercises or is lagging as well and it's just yeah generally if you do this middle method and you rush properly which is a tactic we'll go over a little bit later in this video if you do that you will be able to get admiral the navy if you need help there are some pvp tools on my discord server that can help give you notifications of when you should be doing your attempts note you can also do your exercises a little bit early so instead of going from 5 to 10 5 to 10 5 to 10 all the time you can go from 0 to 5 this actually has some benefit because it is actually more common for somebody sitting in that zero to five range to actually blow their exercises early. One of the reasons they're sitting in the zero to five range is because they blow all their exercises in one attempt. So it's actually easier to kind of lasso yourself onto one of those people in that zero to five range. More of the people who are intentionally lagging actually sit in that five to 10 range. So some seasons I've actually found more success in being able to lag in that zero to five range than that five to 10 range, just because of the psychology of the players that sit in those ranges during the season. Another thing to take into consideration is by being in that zero to five range, you'll likely not drop below the thousand rank mark which is where you start to kind of lose merit points so if you're trying to also maximize merit points doing your season in the zero to five range instead of that five to ten range could be some benefit so let's talk about rushing how azure lanes ranks work is you only have to be a certain rank on the server for a fraction of a time period to actually obtain the rank. So it doesn't you don't have to end the season that way. And for that, it makes us have a viable rushing strategy. Basically, you find the rank that you are shooting for for that season, the highest rank being Admiral of the Navy, and you find on that chart that I had up earlier where you could obtain those points based on the strategy you're using. At that point in time, as soon as that reset comes up, you will rush. So for an Admiral of the Navy, your standard to do your rush is on the second Friday of the season or two and a half days before the season ends. Depending on if you're super lagging or regular lagging, it will be at noon or 6 p.m. So typically most players will have it at 6 p.m. who are undefeated and playing the leftmost player every time. So how a rush works is 15 minutes or so before a rush period would happen, you want to zero out your exercises, whether that's from 10 or from 5, you want to zero them out, get as high as possible. Then as soon as the set works over, you are going to then do your five exercises for that reset as fast as possible, as quickly as possible, obviously getting wins and the purpose is to try and get that rank very quickly. Another thing to note is when you are rushing, there is a chance that you get negative 
points from your base rank score because you'll be playing potentially people that are lower than you if you are rushing for Admiral the Navy because once you get into the top 100 they start to not always have two people ahead of you and two people below you. So you do have to use your five resets to maybe get somebody who is a higher rank than you because you want to get 10 points every time and you don't want to be taking those nine point losses but if you have to take a nine point loss just take it you can actually if you're going for admiral the navy you can look at the rankings and see how many points you are away and then you can do your calculations that way if you rush you'll actually decrease your total score at the end of the season so if you want to maximize your rank at the end of the season you're not going to rush until the last reset actually you don't even have to rush the last reset you can just lag like normal basically if you're just trying to go for the highest high score rather than rushing i typically like to rush just to get my admiral navy out of the way and definitely if you're going for an admiral navy the first time you definitely should rush so this video is getting kind of long but there is one more strategy that i want to talk about for high-end pvp and that is the defense fleet a lot of people think the defense fleet is meaningless. It is not. It's just that the fact you'll never see the direct benefit from effectively playing defense fleet. So a couple of things that you want to do with your defense fleet is basically you want players to not lag. You want to entice players to not lag. Now, who is going to not be lagging? Those are going to be the newer players who have no shot at getting a top rank, and they are just going to come in and play every exercise that they think they can win, and so you want to give them a farmable fleet. You want to give them an easy fleet so that you they can beat you, get those points, run their exercises, and then you can in turn farm them. So you're like letting them farm you to farm them. Kind of like a nice helpful PvP community, but that is really what you want to do on week one of the season because you don't want to get stuck behind a new player who cannot fight and cannot win any exercises. If they can't win any exercises, they're not going to get any points and you're going to be stuck behind them and you can't lag. Now, hopefully one of your four people can actually win their exercises, but realistically, you might actually get stuck behind a newer player. So in that first season, you want to equip a joke team. If you want to be really nice, you actually put in strong ships that have no synergy and you take off all their equips and then that will give them the most XP and it will give them an easy win and you'll be able to farm them back. A lot of people ask, is this really effective? Because for this to be effective, you need to be paired with somebody who is also has you as the pair. You got to both be paired with each other. But that's actually not that hard to do because how the ranking system pairs is people near your rank. And every person has two people above them and two people below them with the exception of the top 100 people. And that means that your highest player or the most left player on your screen has a good chance that you are their most right player on their screen and vice versa for other players so there's actually a good chance that you run into somebody who you have both as an opponent for both of you you can attack them they can attack you it is in this first week that not getting stuck on your lag is super important because your actual bonus points for lagging are higher than one in week one rather than in week two, they're always going to be one point. Maybe two if you're like 60 points and you super lag, but that's really uncommon and very luck based. So generally making sure that you don't get stuck in week one will determine your final positioning if you're going for that top 100 rank. Notice that I continually only say for week one. In week two, you want to put in your best defense fleet possible. The reason why is because there is at some point where, one, you need someone else to lose. If you can actually get these middle tier people to lose, it gives you extra chance in the rank. But if they have a meta fleet, they will be able to beat you based on the game mechanics I mentioned earlier in this video. Why would you care that much? What makes the difference? Well, the other aspect of this is if you let one of these middle tier people into the ranks during that second week of the season, there's a chance that you'll get paired with them. However, they will have a weaker fleet because they got into the into the top ranks because they beat you, not necessarily because they beat another good defense fleet. So when they get paired up against another good defense fleet, they have a chance of actually losing. If they lose and you're paired against them, you will actually get stuck with them. So you need to make sure that you don't get stuck with people who cannot beat top meta fleets 
in week two because you need to actually you actually want to play good players in week two because they will consistently actually do their exercises and they will win their exercises so at some point on that weekend in between the end of the seasons because a season is two weeks in that middle week end, you want to find a period to switch over your defense fleet when do i typically do that well i typically do that once i see a player that i am familiar with in the top 100 ranks in the top 100 ranks on all these servers as I'm collecting the data, 50 of them are the same every season. So I know what they look like. At the end of week one, the amount of people that are still defeated at the top of the ranks in the server are kind of limited. So the chances that you're, and you're going to be paired up with them. So the chances that you're paired up with somebody that you know from the end of the season is pretty high, especially over the course of a couple of resets over the weekend. So when I see that person that I know is going to be at the end of the season, I know they're going to be playing. I know they have a fleet that can crush my defense fleet. I actually wait to see them and then I switch, make my switch to the defense fleet. So I know that they would be able to do their exercises and I don't have to worry about getting kind of hiccuped in that switch for the lag so that's what i do another thing that you can do is if you're trying to do that way perma right where you're logging in every 15 minutes to see if your opponents have done their exercises one of the things you can do is while you're online logging in you put in a really farmable fleet and then when you log out for the evening or when you like go for an extended break you put in a really hard defense fleet and that just kind of allows you to when you're checking have people farm you more easily and then when you're not checking to not have you lose a lot of rank which will cost you merit points so that's really what you have to do for the defense fleet the only other thing you'd want to do is if you are rushing you want to change your defense fleet to something that is super stally not necessarily the strongest fleet you want super stally would mean ships that have invincibility or a lot of evasion yukakaze hiru Enterprise, Eldridge, these sort of ships are ships you want to use in those sort of fleets. Anything that really will prolong the battle. If you're in and if you're rushing, the people you're going to be going against are likely going to be able to beat your fleet regardless of what you put in because of the way that the mechanics work. But if you can make them spend an extra 15 or 30 seconds beating you, you can get the edge in that rush. So that's one of the things you want to do. And then immediately after you're done rushing, you switch back to your strongest defense fleet. So that's all I have for you today, guys. Thank you for watching. I know it was long and technical, but it was the advanced guide, so I don't feel that bad. If you do want guides of like this nature in the future, subscribe to the channel. Let me know in the comments. We also do some other fun end game content here on the channel and you know some ranking with some fun meme fleets as well.